Grace and peace are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. Word of God for our consideration on this day of Pentecost is a portion of the Old Testament lesson. Um, it's actually, I think, covering the whole thing. Uh, Ezekiel 37. I'm not going to read all of it to you here, but let's uh, just hear uh, Ezekiel's introduction here uh, as a way of getting back into the flow of the account of the Valley of the Dry Bones. The hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by his spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. And I saw many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. This is God's word. Well, Pentecost Day is about visions and dreams, among other things, and so let me, let me cast a dream before you here this morning, maybe really more of a nightmare. Picture yourself where uh, I usually am on a Sunday morning, uh, standing here looking out at you, and I know for some of you that's already the nightmare. <laughs> But as you uh, look out at the congregation in front of you, you see uh, a menagerie of people. They are young and they are old. They are dressed, some of them in their Sunday best, uh, for the most part more casual, you know, we don't really make a big deal about clothes here. But sticking out from the collars and the shirt sleeves are nothing but skulls and bones. There is uh, nothing there but skeletons. And, and then, uh, if you kind of put this in your imagination, as though you're in a movie, the, the, the scene pans around like the camera panning in a movie to, to this spot here. A and uh, be before you stands uh, somebody dressed in a, in a robe and a stole. But, but once again, standing inside is nothing but a skeleton, nothing but bones. The vision is a picture of the spiritual life and health of a congregation. And I am not going to suggest to you today or to claim that the spiritual life and health of this congregation is necessarily all that bad. But but we know that within the church, within Christianity, it can be. We, we think of the words that the angel of the Lord gave to John in the book of Revelation chapter 3 in the letter that was written to the church in Sardis. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. It's not unlike the vision that Ezekiel sees in these words of chapter 37 today. Except, of course, in his case, what he has before them is not a, a, a New Testament a Christian congregation. This is the Old Testament people of God. It's the nation of Israel. And as I said, I'm not suggesting that our congregation is where they were. At least not yet. But Ezekiel's words give us an opportunity to pause and to take stock, to consider what is the health of of God's people where we are. What is my personal spiritual health? And they also enable us to hear, to understand, to grasp this promise of God that no matter what that might be, God's Spirit, through His own power and life, has the ability to, to raise up God's people. The Spirit can raise people from being nothing more than a spiritual cemetery of bones to being God's own military, his vast army here on earth. And so today, let's take some time to consider, to review, that the Spirit can raise us from cemetery to military. 
Ezekiel's picture, his vision, is a sad vision of a nation that had forgotten its God. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley that was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Well, what's the picture here? God hadn't literally taken Ezekiel out to some ancient battlefield where there were the remains of soldiers who had fallen in battle that had never been buried, but rather he is portraying for him a more spiritual truth of his times. And he interprets this vision for Ezekiel in uh, following verses. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. We are cut off. You know, this is a nation that had such an important role to play in God's plan to save the world. And yet somehow the nation had managed to forget its God. And so God had brought upon them the Babylonians. And and the Babylonians had invaded the nation and they destroyed its cities and they carried off the most important and prominent and powerful people into exile in Babylon 600 miles away. Their institutions were gone. Their cities were gone. Their... Their way of life was gone. Their temple was gone. Their businesses were gone. Their civilization, practically everything they knew and loved and cherished, it was all gone. The the, the, the very culture and identity that they had as a people was on the verge of extinction. How had they come to this point? Well, long before the Babylonians came and took those citizens away, their faith was gone. It had disappeared, (coughs) at least for most of them. There are many things with which to occupy our lives, aren't there? There's money to be made, fun to be had, experiences to enjoy, goals to achieve, promotions to which to aspire, pleasures to know. And Israel had indulged themselves in most or all of these. But in taking in all that life had to offer, they had forgotten their God. That had ceased to be a part of life. Oh, it's actually true that at the time that he's, uh, well, just before when Ezekiel writes, actually, at the time leading into the exile, uh, that they looked like they were a very actively religious people. Uh, Many of them still went to the temple on a regular basis, but for the most part, those who did attend the temple were simply going through the motions. And uh, many, if not most of them, had actually gone off to other gods. You know, they worshipped the Baals. They they were looking for a a religion, a faith that was more fun. It had more excitement to it. And so they forsook their God. From God's point of view, when he looked down at this nation, well, what he saw was essentially a spiritual cemetery. Just a bunch of dry bones. And and understand, these people were spiritually dead, but this is not dead in the sense of recently dead. This is not in the dead in the sense of just dead, you know, like that person who's just collapsed from a heart attack. And maybe you'll bring them back to life if you do some trust compressions. The bones that Ezekiel sees are very dry. The spiritual life is gone. As I've said, I I don't think that our congregation's that far gone. Not nearly. But remember the Apostle Paul once wrote to the Corinthians that that when you see these Old Testament examples, uh, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us 
on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. And the truth is that not all our vital signs look all that good. I don't think I have to tell you, I mean, again, stand in my place, but you know this, that our congregation as a whole seems to be weighted demographically towards people at kind of one stage in life, and they are not young. And understand, I got nothing against old people. I have nothing against senior citizens. I am on the cusp of becoming one myself. But what does it say for the future? Somehow along the way, uh, not just in this congregation, but in, in Christianity across the span, uh, the, the middle and older aged people have somehow failed to to pass the baton of faith and to pass the baton of service back to those in the generations that are coming up after them. Across our own church body, attendance at things like worship and or Bible class has taken a steep drop. And again, we're not alone in this. In, in many congregations, they have gone to shaving down the size of the administration. They, they have cut the number of people that are needed to serve on the standing boards and committees because they simply can't populate them. And even doing so, very often, they have vacancies. They can't, can't get volunteers to fill in all the slots. Why is that? Have we become so busy doing all the things that we think are so important in life, achieving all the accolades we desired, enjoying all the fun we wanted. Have we forgotten the one thing needful? That we have become unconcerned about the state of our spiritual health and as a result, our spiritual life is actually slowly ebbing away. Can God breathe life into these churches? Can God make these dry bones live? Well, he had an answer for Ezekiel. And what we see is that he has means. He has means by which he is going to turn them from a spiritual cemetery into his military. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I, I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared in them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet a vast army. That again was the vision. That's the picture, right? Ezekiel preaching to this grand valley of dry bones until the very life of God enters into them. And then and here's the interpretation, here's the meaning. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Well, what was this message that God could give to Israel and then they would live? Well, th that is the message. God's own promise that when my word speaks to you, you will live. I will bring you back to life. Now, now for these people, understand that this is, this is specific to their situation in the Babylonian captivity. For God's Old Testament people, he was promising that he was going to bring them up from the, the, the grave that Babylon was to them as a nation. That they, they weren't going to lose their identity as God's own people. That they were, were going to continue 
to fulfill God's plan. You, you know that for this people, if God had tied everything in his plan to save the world to them, to the Jews, and to the land that he had given them to occupy. And so if God were to bring them back, back to faith, back to their home, his promises could be filled. Then it was that the Savior of the world could come, the very Savior that they were waiting for. Then they would have life as a nation. This wasn't really mostly a matter of their earthly existence, although that was necessary for God's plans. But when the Savior came, if the Savior came, if they were brought back to their land and could fulfill God's purposes, then even their death would not be death to them. The fact is that most of the people to whom Ezekiel uh, brought this message, as they went into the beginning of the exile, they were going to be there 70 years. Most of them were going to live out the rest of their lives there, and they were going to die and be buried in Babylon. But if the Lord preserved their nation and their faith, and their children and their grandchildren came home, and they remained as a nation, then the Savior they longed for could be brought into the world. Eternity itself would be waiting for them after death. Then there was a real life, a real spiritual life, a real eternal life to which they could look forward. Babylon would not become the nation's cemetery. God raises us up. He does so with a slightly different emphasis and way. It's a variation, however, of this same message. God promises us life. He promises that he's going to literally bring us out of our graves, as he would also do for them. The body you inhabit now is going to die, and he's going to bring it back to life. And he can do so because that Savior came. And do you know that for you to have that spiritual life, to have the faith that brings it to you, how God has connected the the word, the spirit of life in the words of our Savior Jesus Christ to your spiritual life. So often Jesus in his own ministry, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And will not be condemned. He's crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth. A time is coming and has now come. When those who are dead will hear the word of the Son of God and live. John chapter 5. My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him, shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The flesh counts for nothing. The spirit gives life. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Word, spirit, life. John chapter 6. My sheep, listen, listen, listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. Listen, eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. John chapter 10. And so on, it goes throughout Jesus' ministry. So so it goes throughout the New Testament. God has connected the power of his life-giving spirit to the power of the preaching of his word. And it is through that promise of the forgiveness of sins through the Savior Jesus Christ who gave his blood for our cleansing and who rose from the dead as a promise of our own resurrections from the dead that that life is guaranteed to us. These dry bones can live. But if God is going to raise us from cemetery to military, if he's going to give us life back again, 
well, then we actually have to hear the preaching of God's word, right? The, the Apostle Paul kind of anticipates the question, you know, how, how can that happen? How can that be done? In Romans chapter 10, when he says, uh, you know, how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And of course, the answer is obvious. They can't. But that's why God sends them. That's why God sends you. Surely you know. Look, look around you this morning. Look around you this morning. Surely you know someone who is not in church, whether it's here or somewhere else. How can they hear without someone preaching to them? Okay, if you don't want to be the preacher, well, then call them. Invite them. Bring them in. Introduce them to Jesus. Let the dry bones live. Now I'm going to do some meddling. A number of years ago in my former congregation, uh, we, we put together what we call the spiritual checkup, and we had the uh, members come in to kind of see where they, were, where they were. A little bit like you go for your doctor for your physical, you know, but you went to your pastor. We gave you a spiritual checkup. And uh, I had Bill Raditz there. He's in heaven now. And uh, Bill got most of the answers to the questions right. You know, he was doing pretty well. But uh, then I asked him the question. So, so Bill, I, I, I recognize you. You've stopped coming to Sunday school and Bible class. And you, you, don't, you don't show up at the midweek services anymore. What's wrong? And his answer to me was, Pastor, now you're meddling. So here I go with you. I know that I cannot pass a rule that requires you to show up here. When we have Bible class before church, when we have special services in the middle of the week, when we have other Bible study opportunities throughout the year, a rule wouldn't be right. Maybe a few of you read and study scripture on your own at home. I know many people who claim to do so. But frankly, in my experience as a pastor over 30 plus years, is that the people who do that are the people who first go to those extra services and Bible classes, not instead of. Exceptions notwithstanding. But I can't pass a rule because that would be legalism. But what I can do is present to you the power and promise of God's word. Do you believe the promise that God has given to us today through the prophet Ezekiel? Do, do you see and understand that when you are exposed to his word in this way, the very power and life of God, the Holy Spirit, lives in you? He can change your life. He can open your mouth. He can empower your life and ministry. Do you believe that promise when you are exposed to the word of God as he promises here? Let God's word raise you up. I'm not saying that you're already dry bones. I mean, my goodness, you're here listening to me at this moment today. But that doesn't change the fact that his spirit gets in you when you hear his word. And that message of life has the power not just to raise us from a spiritual cemetery, but it will raise us from cemetery to military. What does Ezekiel see? Do you see it? So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. God makes us his army. Have you ever seen the movie uh, Apollo 13? Um, most of us are old enough to have lived through it. You remember Walter Cronkite calling it out on CBS back in the early 70s. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there comes the point uh, that this third NASA mission has run into some serious problems and... and uh, the, the spacecraft is crippled and it's, it's limping back to the Earth. The, 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 the time comes for them to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. In the movie, they have a, a conversation uh, at, uh, at, in, in Houston at the NASA headquarters between two of the administrators about whether or not this is going to be their greatest disaster. And 
Gene Krantz, maybe you know the name, flight director, turns and says to them, I, I, I beg your pardon, sir, but I believe this is going to be our greatest hour. And of course, they brought them home. Maybe not all of our congregation's signs, vital signs look good all the time. Kind of limp along. But if we'll trust the promise of the word, if we'll expose ourselves to it, if we'll let the Spirit do his work, if he can raise us yet today from the spiritual cemetery, well, then this may be our finest hour. God may not only let these dry bones live, but become his vast army in the world to do his will today. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord and live. Amen. Please stand.